There is a string of abandoned history linked with the infamous criminals and bank robbers, Bonnie and Clyde. Come with us now as we dive back into the time of 1930s and explore the abandoned history and ghost towns of Bonnie and Clyde. Hello and welcome to another Midwest Ghost Town podcast. My name is Dan Klein. I'm your host, your history enthusiast, and your ghost town and abandoned history adventurer. And like we say on this channel, let's keep history alive. And one way we can certainly do that is by talking about it and making this podcast and, of course, videos as well. We have a good one for you today, and this one took some more time to dig up additional details, rewinding the clock to the 1930s. It was a time of economic turmoil and lawlessness in the heartland of America. A young couple emerged from the shadows, wreaking havoc across the South and the Midwest. Their names were Bonnie Parker and Clyde Barrow, or better known as Bonnie and Clyde. With guns in their hands and adrenaline in their veins, they became legends in their own right. Bonnie and Clyde roamed dusty roads, leaving a trail of fear in their wake. Small towns were both curious and scared upon their arrival, and the couple was both cunning, elusive, and always one step ahead of the law. Following and connecting the dots in history along the trail of Bonnie and Clyde's crime spree is an interesting one to say the least, mainly because it mixed in with hard facts and true accounts. Are the stories and legends of the past stuff that make up stories for grandkids and their kids for future generations? Searching for details of what banks Bonnie and Clyde robbed and which ones they didn't? Stories of what places the gang stopped for the night or camped out and which ones they didn't. And of course, stories of cafes where they might have stopped for a bite to eat. And naturally, like we've been discussing, which ones they didn't. But before we go into a lot of detail in some of these places that are now abandoned or have ghost town status, let's familiarize ourselves with the background story of Bonnie and Clyde. Clyde Barrow and Bonnie Parker, famously known as Bonnie and Clyde, were American outlaws who gained notoriety during the Great Depression in the 1930s. Their life of crime and infamy made them one of the most notorious criminal duos in American history. Clyde Chestnut Barrow was born on March 24, 1909 in Teleco, Texas. He came from a poor family and grew up in a rural farming community. Clyde showed signs of delinquency from an early age and his criminal activities escalated as he grew older. He was first arrested in 1926 for automobile theft. And over the next few years, he became involved in a series of robberies and burglaries, often targeting small stores and gas stations. Bonnie Elizabeth Parker was born on October 1st, 1910 in Rowena, Texas. She had a relatively normal upbringing and was considered a bright and talented student. However, her life took a turn when she married Roy Thornton at the age of 16. But their marriage quickly deteriorated and Bonnie and Roy eventually separated, although they never officially divorced. In January 1930, Bonnie met Clyde through a mutual friend and the two formed a romantic relationship. Bonnie was attracted to Clyde's daring and rebellious nature and she soon became his devoted partner in crime. Their criminal activities intensified when Clyde was in prison for robbery and car theft in April 1930. During his incarceration, Bonnie smuggled a gun into the prison for Clyde, which he used to escape. So let's go over this account exactly. So on Tuesday, March 11th, 1930, Bonnie had her usual visit with Clyde at the McLennan County Jail on the second floor. When she got there, Clyde began whispering to her details of a planned escape he wanted her to go to fellow inmate William Turner's home in East Waco, find a revolver he had there, and smuggle that revolver back to the jail. Time was everything. Because Clyde was worried he was going to be transferred and their chance for escape squashed. 
And this was a defining moment for the couple because on one hand, Bonnie could choose to walk away at this moment and be done with Clyde. She could have walked from the county jail and never returned, leaving Clyde to be locked up for a long time for his criminal activities. In essence, smuggling a gun into jail and helping convicts escape from jail would be enough to entrap Bonnie to go to prison herself. He essentially was asking Bonnie to risk everything. It was equally defining for Clyde. It was a test of sorts to see just how much Bonnie loved him, just how devoted she was to him, willing to sacrifice herself and risk it all for the man she loved. But in reality, this was exactly what Bonnie wanted, a romantic adventurous love affair with danger and risk, so Bonnie agreed to do it. It was proof that she was loyal, and she would do whatever she was asked. He was in charge. As she left, Clyde had scratched a love note to her, saying, You are the sweetest baby in the world to me. I love you. So, Here's in essence what really happened, kind of looking at this. So Bonnie leaves the jail and she heads down to, to the home of Turner. And as she gets to the residence, she's following the directions that Clyde gave her, but they're really mixed up directions. So she's looking for this revolver in the house. She can't find it. So she is ripping this house, make a huge mess. She finally finds the revolver, not where... It said it was supposed to be. She gets the revolver and, of course, now becomes the new problem. How do you take this revolver and sneak it back into the jail and not get caught? Of course, this is everything. If Bonnie gets caught, it's all over. Clyde goes to prison like he's going to go, and now so does Bonnie. So she goes back to the jail, and she confronts the same guard that she saw earlier that day. That guard immediately is not going to let her back in because Bonnie had already had her limit of visits for the day. She had already been there. And so, of course, curiosity came into play and the guard was wondering, why are you trying to visit again, Bonnie? So this is where Bonnie kind of pours it on a little bit and she's able to talk the guard into letting her go in and just visit Clyde one more time. She's able to somehow smuggle that revolver into the jail and this is where history takes a curve as we know it so there were three in the escape plan there was clyde william turner and a man by the name of emory abernathy all there for burglary and bank robbery charges and william turner starts to fake that he's sick about 7 30 ish and began asking for milk to help his stomach. Assistant County Jailer Irving Stanford brings Turner some milk, and as he opens the jail cell, he is greeted by a revolver pointed at him and demanding the keys to the cell. The three criminals quickly lock Stanford in the cell, and as they begin to leave, caught another jailer in the low security office. They of course refused to shoot him, wanting to escape without killing anyone, and demanded that he stay at his desk for five minutes as they make their escape. However, they didn't check to see that the guard had a sidearm and immediately ran after the convicts. As the trio began to run away, the guard shot his gun, missing on all his shots and giving Abernathy enough time to turn and return fire. The shots, of course, awakened the neighborhood and the police were called. Clyde immediately hot wires a car, they escaped through the Waco streets. And after several stolen cars being swapped out and darting across the country, leaving a trail of star stolen cars in their wake, they finally end up in Middletown, Ohio, which is a town between Dayton and Cincinnati. Of course, after another robbery attempt, the three fugitives were finally captured and sent back to Texas, which eventually ended Clyde into the dreaded work prison of East Ham prison farm known as the bloody ham and this is a dark twisted story that evolved into helping turn Clyde into a hardened criminal from being sexually assaulted to murdering his assaulter 
to cutting off two of his toes eventually with an ax to help avoid physical labor at the camp. And of course, this kind of leads and propels us to the story of where we are today. In February 1932, Clyde was paroled after serving only 14 months of his sentence. He reunited with Bonnie and the duo embarked on a series of bank robberies, armed robberies and murders across several states. They were often accompanied by a gang that included Clyde's brother, Buckborough, and his wife, Blanche. The gang's activities brought them increasing attention from law enforcement, and as their crimes escalated, Bonnie and Clyde became folk heroes to some, admired for their audacity and defiance during the Great Depression era, but many people began to see them as modern-day Robin Hood, stealing from the rich banks, the same system that had taken their money, and they became instant sensations. To the delight of Bonnie, who always wanted to be a movie star or a celebrity on Broadway. However, and this is important, however, because I want to make sure that people understand where I'm going with this. Their violent actions left a trail of destruction, including numerous deaths of law enforcement officers and innocent civilians. Basically, at that time frame, when that started to happen, the public opinion on Bonnie and Clyde began to appropriately shift away from treating them as heroes and really kind of seeing them as they are, true criminals, murderers, and killers. Some would even say psychopaths. Their criminal spree came to an end on May 23, 1934, when a group of law enforcement officers ambushed Bonnie and Clyde in Louisiana. The officers opened fire on their car, riddling it with bullets, and ending the lives of Bonnie and Clyde, who died together in a hail of gunfire. Despite their short and tumultuous lives, Bonnie and Clyde's story captured the imagination of the American public, left a lasting legacy as symbols of rebellion and criminal romanticism. Their tale has been immortalized in literature, music, film, cementing their place in American criminal folklore. However, it's just important to kind of see this. You know, there's two sides of that, like I was just mentioning. The one that's kind of seeing that and romanticizing it, and the other is just the true untold story, the story that maybe isn't blown out of proportion and really kind of seen as the truth that they had a hard life. There was, you know, stories that Bonnie's leg was severely burned in, in a car accident in one of the chases, and, you know, they were constantly camping out. They were constantly on the run from authorities. They were constantly getting in shootouts. And, of course... We know that there was death and destruction that followed that. But of course, here at Midwest Ghost Town, we focus our attention on the history of abandoned places, most notably ghost towns. And connecting the associations with these places with Bonnie and Clyde has been a fascinating endeavor, both in research and presentation. Of course, like I mentioned earlier, there is with good sense that some of the facts become blurred with fiction and it stands to reason that some places are either more folklore or that we don't even have all the stories compiled where the criminal couple hid away. There is one story which we will share in another episode where they were rumored to have a secret hideout in Illinois, an abandoned farmhouse. And there were other stories from locals that told me of towns where they might have had a robbery. Gas stations, stores, rural places, stories of cars being stolen in the dead of the night. Because after all, Clyde did love his Ford V8s, and he would hotwire these cars and often leave a trail of these stolen cars behind as he zigzagged his way across the nation. But we start our ghost town trail down around Dallas, Texas. West Dallas, to be exact. And a place that would become known as Cement City. Cement City was recognizable by its large smokestacks that lined the skyline and providing tough work. It was where one would go if they needed to work. Low paying as it was, it was considered the slums of Dallas. And once you arrived in Cement City, you often remained. The Barrow family found their way to Cement City with Clyde's father typically picking up scrap metal and hauling it to foundries to be sold for pennies and melted down. 
It was a beggar's living. But it provided something. The Barrow family was dirt poor like most families in the area during that period. But it was noted that as they were gathering materials to build a home, their current home was a simple wagon that they slept beneath to cover them from the rain. But often, it was just an open sky. Slowly, a small shack was built, and the family at least had a roof above their heads. And this was living in Cement City. Cement City was a small town in West Dallas. It was created to support workers in the cement plants operating in the area. And the town was situated on the Texas and Pacific Railroad line, just north of the reunion lands about three miles west of the Dallas County Courthouse. Just like many industrial manufacturing towns, however, it had a boom and bust story. In 1908, the Texas Portland Cement Company acquired the plant, announced plans to expand their plant production, and part of their plans included creating a town. So they incorporated the city of cement on the 28th of April, 1908. A post office opened in 1907, and by 1911, more stores, schools, other services sprang up to support families of cement workers now living in houses built and owned by the Texas Portland Cement Company. By 1910, Cement City had reached a population of 503. And this is where Bonnie Parker enters the story. In 1914, Bonnie's father, Charles Parker, died unexpectedly and forced her mother, Emma, to seek refuge with her parents, Frank and Mary Krause, who lived in Cement City. So Emma moved her family 240 miles across Texas to Dallas and across the Trinity River and to the impoverished neighborhoods of Cement City. It was reported that Bonnie's mother needed to take work as a seamstress to help make money since her father couldn't afford to take on four more people in the household. So it was reported that her weekly wages were nine and a half dollars. It was a factory town, dirty and loud, but this is the area where Bonnie and Clyde grew up. Even though Clyde moved a little further away, Bonnie, however, attended Cement City School when she was six. She was reported as being a smart, a cute little girl, but had enough character to always make herself stand out. The short, blonde Bonnie was even known to have a temper, as her mother Emma admitted in later reports. She found her way through school. She was willing to punch it out with boys and girls over simple things, like pencils. But her overall dream was always to see her name in lights and to be on Broadway. And later in life, as a teen, she became obsessed with makeup and fashion clothing, and it was a typical thing for the girls in Cement City to want to be like movie stars. But the harsh reality was that many of them would live the remaining parts of their lives in Cement City. Hollywood didn't scout the projects, and they certainly didn't scout the slums of Cement City outside Dallas, Texas. And Bonnie certainly didn't have enough money to gain their attention at auditions nor enough money to break herself free to earn a tuition at college. This was life in Cement City. The city's governing body dissolved as quickly as it started, with the 1913 election being the last for Cement City. Though the town remained incorporated for many more years, the post office closed in 1915, and the school district operated until 1928, when Dallas Independent School District annexed it. The city's population reached its high point in 1920 with 878 and was down to 450 by the 1960 census. This was the last recording for Cement City. Today, Cement City is a ghost town and the only thing remaining of what was known as Cement City is the cemetery. But of course, this is only the beginning it marks the start of Bonnie and Clyde and explains their impoverished beginnings in West Dallas, Texas. And although Cement City is no longer, the tragic story of the couple moves on. So, 
as we speed up to where Bonnie and Clyde begin their 21 months crime spree from their chief beginnings in 1932 to their very end in 1934. There is the second story of the ghost town of Woodville, Oklahoma. This is a town reporting having 360 residents in 1944 before it was fully submerged underwater by Lake Texacoma. The ghost town played a part in the Bonnie and Clyde story, where they were reported to come to Old Woodville to watch chicken fights. Camping in the area known as Washita Point, they stayed for weeks, residing in the Oklahoma countryside and clearing out without any incidents. There are more stories to come in part two of Ghost Towns of Bonnie and Clyde next week. We'll tell more of their stories from a prison break to Bonnie and Clyde on the road with multiple shootouts and a string of bank robberies, leading all the way to their final confrontation. But a big story next week, of course, will highlight a ghost town in Iowa and an abandoned amusement park in Iowa, marking the end of Clyde's brother, Buckborough, as the blinding and arrest of his wife, Blanche. More stories to come, more ghost towns, more abandoned history, all surrounding the criminal lives and activities of Bonnie and Clyde. We love to have conversations about history. The story of Bonnie and Clyde are no exception. Certainly, I know we have some history buffs and history fans in the audience that might have a fascination about Bonnie and Clyde. And I would absolutely love to hear some of your comments. So go ahead, drop a comment below if you're familiar with the bank robbery or just a robbery in general by Bonnie and Clyde. Maybe it's a story or folklore from your area. Maybe some unknown story that maybe most of us haven't heard before. Maybe an old story that you have heard from your parents or passed down from your grandparents. Before we close part one of this podcast, I want to drop a resource that I use for some background story with this episode along with many different videos and audios listening to the stories about the infamous duo. There were also a few films I watched. There was not as much facts in those, but for painting a picture of what it might have been like. The movie Bonnie and Clyde, for example. But another good one was The Highwayman, which you can find on Netflix. But the book, Go Down Together, The True Untold Story of Bonnie and Clyde by Jeff Ginn. So those are some resources for you. Conversations about history. Stories that transcend generations. Sifting through fiction and fact. Separating myth from reality. It's all part of the historical process as we learn together. And like we say on this channel, through these discussions, let's keep history alive. This is Midwest Ghost Town.